Um, so we're going to just pick up from where we were last week. And last week we were discussing the, or we've been in the, in the process of discussing for a number of weeks now, the case of the person who is uh, very too overly self-serving with their uh, material possessions. Because uh, as, as, Solomon pointed, as King Solomon pointed out to us, when it comes to finding happiness from the worldly possessions, one of the things, one of the prerequisites is to do good with it. Now, again, he hasn't necessarily discussed what is doing good, but he's definitely discussing what is not doing good. Um, and that's what he would kind of been focusing on the past couple of weeks, is we have this person that he's talking about who's uh, resorted to tyranny, uh, to you know, using their influence, using their material possessions to uh, control other people, to, uh, uh, to be author authoritarian, and um, and and he says that at that what well, we got into the very end of last week was that such a person uh, starts to lose that difference the 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 different defining line between mankind and uh, and the animal world uh, and as I, I we kind of spoke last week about this this idea that if you were to look at the animal world and you were to say well how do animals progress? How do animals go about their, their lives? They, it's as Darwin made it clear to us, it's survival of the fittest, right? And that every animal has to look out for its own survival. And that's its number one priority. And so in a sense, uh, this person who is arguing the same thing, this person is saying, you know, it's, it's all up to me to take care of myself and I can't be bothered taking care of other people. I can't be doing good with my material, it's it's them or me, and it's I, I choose me, uh, with a very black and white look at, look at it. You know, obviously that's there's gradations, but this person is taking it to the extreme and saying it's all about me uh, over the other person, um, and that's where the person start, starts to lose their humanity. As we said, one of the things that differentiates humans from animals is that we have empathy, we've got emotions, we've got a sense of uh, of of care, of need to care for the other person uh, that the animal world doesn't have. If somebody loses that, then uh, his what how King Solomon put it was that a man is no long is no greater, humankind is no greater than the animal world. If a person loses that sense of uh, of empathy for other people, then they are no greater than the than the animal kingdom. At the same time, one last thing that King Solomon points out to us is he says, Ki hakol havel, because all of it is havel. And as we mentioned before, havel is this kind of idea, uh, at least how, how we've been using it. And when we've been going through the book of Kohelet, what we've been understanding is that havel is kind of this idea that although at first glance it seems pretty useless, this, whatever the ideas that we're talking about when we describe it as havel, the idea itself is pretty useless. It's not. Um, helpful and it's it's what we would what is usually translated again usually havel is translated as um vain or or nothingness but what we are trying to understand is that there is an idea of havel that havel means that there's something there steam so you can't catch steam with your hands but if you have the right tools you do what you would know how to uh, distill steam into liquid uh and so we're gonna have to see and we're not actually not gonna get to there this week but i believe that in the in, in the coming chapter he's gonna start to discuss what's the useful per, part of this there's a useful and a, and a and a useless part of this so what's the useful part of it he will get there eventually again that's not really what we're discussing right as of this week so uh without any further ado we will jump back into the text and we can start looking at it uh, this week's verses. Uh, we saw last week verse uh, 19. So we start this week with verse 20. Let me just get a, take a second to set up my screen over here so I could see everyone. Okay. So uh, there it's highlighted. This is verse 20. Again, chapter 3, verse 20. And he says like this. <clears throat> King Solomon says, Hakol holeich el makom echad. Everything goes, present tense, everything is going to one place. Hakol, haya min he'afar. Everything came from or was, was brought into existence from dust. Ve hakol shav el ha'afar. And all of it 
will also return to the dust. Okay, let me read that again. Everything is going to one location, to one place. Everything came into being from dust. And everything also is returning, again, that's that present tense, to the dirt. Okay, interesting that he does use a present tense for this entire verse, uh, that everything is brought into existence from dust. Everything is returning to dust. Uh, everything is going to one place. I just, I, I don't have an explanation for that, but I do find that interesting <coughs> that this entire verse is in present tense. Uh, just an, an interesting thought. Uh, again, I don't know what's, what's to glean from that, but there's perhaps something there. Uh, what I want to argue is that this statement is the statement of the, the person that we're talking about, the so-called wicked person. Uh, again, we're, we're actually trying to avoid terms like wicked and righteous because we haven't had a clear definition about what that is. But fine, our, our, our author, author, uh, authoritarian uh, ty uh, tyrant that we're referring to, okay? So this person who's using all the tools of this world, of the, uh, of the um, material world, and he's using it to dominate other people. So this is the claim of the other person, of that person. And they're, they're saying... Yeah, excuse me, King Solomon, right? You're telling me that I'm no better than an animal. Well, my response to you is, so? I'm no better than an animal. That's fine. We're all going to the same place. We're all adding, ending up in the same location at the end of the day. All right? So I'm a human. That's an animal. Who cares? What difference does it make if I want? Why do I need to maintain my humanity? I guess would be one way to put it. What need do I have to be a, to be to maintain my humanity? Fine, I will su subscribe to a full Darwinian survival of the fittest mindset. Might as well. Okay, that's that again. That's what I my, my understanding is of this sentence over here. That um, the person is is taking this flag and and waving it proudly. All right, I am now proudly waving the flag of. Uh, I'm just an animal. Okay. I have no problem with that is basically what he's saying. I do like the kind of the idea afar is dust. So in, uh, in, in, in the Torah literature, typically we understand that um, humankind particularly, but really a lot of the physical world is made of dust, right? You've heard that we've actually touched on this before, the concept of the four elements, uh, elements, uh, so you've got the dust or earth, and you've got wind, fire, and uh, water, right? So, uh, so in that sense, dust being the earth, which man, mankind, right, humankind is made of more than anything else, uh, is the, the the hard physical. Uh, I kind of think of it. Well, if you look at dust, it's a bunch of tiny little particles, but it gathers together to form a huge mass of earth. Uh, and in that sense. Uh, you can almost look at this as, he's, as the person is saying that we're all made, everything is brought into existence from cells or from atoms or molecules. It's all kind of the same idea that he's saying is that this person is claiming we all come from little bits of pe little pe tiny pieces that join together to form one mass, one whole. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I kind of read it as Everything is just a gathering of cells, and all the, and everything will return to just being a gathering of cells at, at some point. Uh, in other words, the argument that this person is making is a very scientific argument, and it's that what differentiates human, humankind from from animal kind? Really, nothing. Okay, if it. Uh, we are cells, they are cells. We break down into it back down into dust at the end of the day. They break down into dust at the end of the day, right? And in that sense, you know, religion and science always have this kind of funny relationship, right? Where religion is uh, seems to constantly have to answer for science, and science is constantly attacking religion. And there's a reason for that, and it's a you know it's an interesting discussion in and of itself. Uh, but what I find interesting over here is that. You could basically say that part of this, what this, what this person is hiding behind is a scientific argument. 
In reality, the person is desiring of something else, of this control, this power, this need for, but then what are they going to hide behind? They're going to hide behind a, a logic, perhaps a false logic, but a logic, right? And we, we will, as humans, this is what we do. Whenever we want to defend our opinion, we will always hide behind some logic of some sort, right? So in that sense, I think that's kind of, kind of what King Solomon's showing us over here is that the argument that is a very logical argument. Right, everything comes to dust. Everything's returned to dust. I'm an animal. You're an animal. We're all just animals. So in that sense, why not just be like an animal? Why not subscribe to Darwin and say, you know what? Yeah, survival of the fittest. That's all there is to it. <clears throat> okay. So, um, with that, we would then return back to King Solomon's response, and that's our verse twenty-one over here. The next verse. Where he says, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have something in my throat. Mi odea, who knows, ruach b'nei Adam, that the spirit of the children of mankind, of humankind, ha'olahi lema'ala, it rises up above, v'ruach ha'behema, and then there's the spirit of the animal, ha'yoredet hi lemata la'aretz, which goes down lower into the ground okay again let me read that as one sentence mi odea who knows ruach b'nei ha'adam the spirit of humankind ha'olahi lamala which rises up above v'ruach ha'behema hayoredet sorry v'ruach ha'behema the spirit of the animals hayoredet hi lamata la'art which descends down below into the earth okay uh, interesting, uh, just an interesting point over here. Rising, this is when you rise, you just rise. When you descend, it's descend below to the ground. It's kind of interesting how there's like three gradations descending, you're red at, lamata below, lars to the ground, as opposed to ola hi lamala, where it rises to, to heights. Same, same word. I, again, I don't have necessarily anything to say on that. It's just an interesting quirk of the of the language over there that rising is just rising and going down descending is descending in steps to deeper and deeper levels okay but what he's saying over here is let's take a let, let's take a, a microscope to this logical argument of the of the of the tyrant okay the logical argument again being that fine we're all just animals i'm okay with that i'm okay with that reality of just being an animal uh, and he says, I, I don't think you are. Uh, mi odea uh, literally means who knows, uh, but it's really a, an invitation, right? We, as we say by the, by the Pesach Seder, right? We say, echad mi odea, who knows one? And it's immediately responded with, I know one, ani, ani odea, right? Echad ani odea. Uh, so in that sense, mi odea uh, is really an invitation. It's saying, take a look over here, fella, right? Do you realize that there's something about humans that differentiates them from animals. Uh, so we have kind of two different ways of looking at this verse over here. Let's take it from a spiritual take first. Humankind has tremendous capabilities, right? We are, uh, again, this is purely from a spiritual perspective. We, we understand as Jews for sure, uh, but I would assume many religions would agree to this. We understand that humans are destined for something more than the animal kingdom, right? We were given special abilities we were given the power of speech we were given the ability to reign over this world uh and and in fact hashem tells adam he tells adam the original person or the prototype prototypical person uh that you are to go and conquer the world it's mankind's uh, uh por portion is to go ahead and conquer the world so in that sense we are very different than animals we are striving and rising towards something greater as opposed to the animal world, which is by its nature, it's going only headed one direction. Okay. When an animal lives, it's born into this world and it lives for one purpose to survive until it dies. Right. So the life of an animal, right. The spirit of an animal is constantly in a descent. Okay. It's born and then it grows up and then eventually dies, Pro procreates, procreates and dies, right? And there's something about humans, again, 
that's very different than, than the animal kingdom. So again, from a spiritual perspective, it's that we have this amazing ability. God has given us this ability to go ahead and be better and do something and create legacy and to, and to, uh, to, to live beyond just eating and dying, right? But I think even if you take the spiritual part of it out, I think still the argument is a is a logical argument back to the person. It says, okay, so you as a person, you ruach b'nei adam, you have a spirit of humankind, and naturally you seem to want something greater out of life, right? Ha'ola hilamala, you have this desire to rise above, right? You the tyrant, you have some 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 reason to rise above other people. Uh, the spirit of the animal. Is not like that. The spirit of the animal does not have a need to conquer. It does not have a need to go and and make something beyond their simple life in this world. So, in other words, humankind needs to progress. We need to have progress. We need to constantly be improving the world around us. And we're not satisfied with living uh, simple lives. You don't find tyranny in that regard, in that sense, in the animal world, in the animal kingdom, because it's that's not natural to animals. So you, the tyrant who we're talking to, you are the very proof to the fact that animals and humans are, are, are different. OK, in other words, what you are living is not just an animal existence. You're actually living a very human existence of that need for control over others, that need for power that need to dominate, that need to, to do something that will make a lasting legacy, that need to uh, gather all your material possessions and use it to lord over other people. That is exactly the thing that is proving to me that we're different than animals. <clears throat> so in other words, you wanna tell me that we're just a collection of cells. If that was true, you should be uh, satisfied with a more docile experience. Uh, in other words, and, and so in other words, your theory of everything comes from dirt, from dust, and everything will return to the, return to the dust. That's an incorrect. It's a illogical. It's a it's it's a false logic uh, because there's really more. And again, you are you ver you yourself are the proof that there's more to this life than there's more to the human existence than uh, th than just living and dying, right? You you are the very the very proof to us that human beings need something else. Okay, so again, let me read the verse one more time. Again, miodea, who knows, ruach b'nei ha'adam, that the spirit of mankind. What is it? What is the spirit? What is the wind? Again, literally, ruach is is wind. All right. So what is the wind in the sails of mankind? It's ha'ole hilamala. It's the fact that we're constantly striving for progress. We're striving for something greater. However, what's the ruach habahema? What is the wind in the sails of the animal kingdom? Hayereda hilamatalar. It's just the fact that it knows it's going to, it's got to beat out the clock, right? So the animals, they know that they have to beat out the clock. So they, you know, take care of everything right away. You know, um, do we have one of our, great books, uh, The Duties of the Heart, Chovot Halavavot. Um, he writes a fascinating thing. And this is, he was a uh, 11th century, uh, 11th, 12th century uh, philosopher, Jewish philosopher. And one of the things that he mentions is you'll notice that for the most part, amongst animals, they don't have a childhood, right? They, for almost all animals are born, if not fully formed, then near to fully formed. Right, they're, they're, that that uh, infantile stage is relatively short, uh, and when it comes to humans, it could last, you know, it could last thirty years, right? <laughs> um, but in reality, it's true. We have we're the only. If we were just an animal, we're the only, we seem to be a pretty not not very well uh, adapted animal because we we take forever to grow up to. You know, they where they find the prefrontal cortex the, of the human mind is not fully developed until 21 years old. Uh, that's a long time. That's a, you know, uh, meanwhile, calves are born walking, right? They're able to walk right away. 
it's it's fascinating. Even marsupials that do have kind of that gestation or post 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 birth uh, raising period. I mean, it's still short. It's not twenty one years. Um, so it is a fascinating thing that we do have that that just looking at the science of it, you notice there's something different about humankind. So the Chavod of Halavavo takes that to mean that we've got a lot of work to do on ourselves. You know, we have the fact that we need so much time before we reach majority. That means that we, we have a lot of work. We're born imperfect, as opposed to in many ways, animals are born as perfect as they need to be, right? A cow just has to be a cow until it turns into a state, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to a human, which we've got, we've got a lot more to accomplish. And again, that's, so the, the tyrant's lifestyle is the very proof to the fact that uh, we're not just a collection of cells returning to the dirt. We are something greater. We are something that lives beyond that. Again, you can look at that from a spiritual perspective and look at it from a, a purely Torah outlook of, yes, Hashem created us with the ability to conquer the world, et cetera. Or you can just look at it as a logical uh, idea of, you know, we're clearly meant for something greater. Whatever meant means in your worldview, we, we are, we're clearly supposed to, you yourself are the proof that mankind is different than, than the animal kingdom, okay? So after having this kind of short little argument with the, uh, the tyrant, I'm just gonna call him that for, for, for ease of, of use. So uh, after that short little uh, back and forth with the tyrant, King Solomon walks away with a major uh, uh, conclusion over here. All right, based on everything we've seen in this chapter. Now, we've been on chapter three for quite a while now, probably six weeks or so, I would say. So this is the last verse in chapter three. Uh, as I mentioned before, chapters are not, they're not our chapters. I, Christian monks made the chapters. Uh, but this one's actually pretty accurate. Uh, it, is a, it is a pretty good um, a conclusion to the thought so far, again, hey, we're, we're not going to close the book on it entirely because he hasn't yet showed us what's the good, what's the, what's the silver lining in this cloud. Uh, but he is kind of putting a little bit of a comma on this idea over here. And he says, Vera iti, and I have seen. Okay. Ki ein tov, it is not good. May I share yismacha adam b'masav for a person to be happy with his or their actions. Right, that's the hard work that they put into this world. Kihu chalko, because it is their portion. Ki, because mi evienu lirot, who will bring them to see the met shia acharav in that which will be after them. Okay, as uh, as Jacob pointed out for, for us last week, right? Whenever you have, it seems to be these verses that start off with "I have seen" or "I am saying." Wherever King Solomon puts his own his own twist on things. The words are, are always little little turgid, a little hard to, to wrap your mind mind around. And I think I have a, I, I think I have a good explanation for these words. But let's let's move let's let's go through it again because it's a long long sentence. Again, Viraiti, I have seen ki to it is not good may I share yismacha adam b'masav for a person that which a person is happy in their actions ki ko because it is their portion. Who will bring them to see the met she yeah in that which will be after them? Okay. Um, so in this verse, I would say that the way to read it is actually so that was the literal word for word translation of the, of the verse, but I actually want to read it a little differently and bear with me this time because. What it sounds like he's saying is, and again, we all we know that Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, is a book that always seems to be depressing. So this is another great example, right? Here's King Solomon telling us, don't be happy with all the hard work you put into this world, right? At the same time, I think there's perhaps another way of reading the same verse where you come out with an up with, with a a cap for this whole idea that we've said so far, which is a, a pretty uplifting message. All right. So let's read it a little differently. Viraiti and I have seen. Ki tov, it is not good. Now, what's not good? May I share yismacha adam b'masav ki hu chelko. When a person enjoys their things because it's their portion and nobody else's. 
Okay. When a person lives a life where everything that they do is only for themselves, it's ki hu chelko, because it's their portion, it's mine. I deserve it. Nobody else deserves this. That is not good for a person to enjoy. You're not going to find joy, really, is what he's saying. All right. Because again, this is the secret. Another one of our secrets to happiness. So secret, again, secret number one, we saw at the beginning of the chapter was that you can't control the things you can't control and you got to figure out how to live with that. But secret number two is you got to figure out also a way to benefit others with your material possessions. And that's what he's saying over here. You want to find yismach, you want to find happiness, you ain't going to find it if you're only enjoying your things because it's yours. It's all mine, right? If you're enjoying it just because it's yours, there you're not going to find happiness. And he says, let's, take, let's look at this. Key, because. Me of Vienna, Uli wrote, the Mashiach wrote. Who will come to show you that which happens afterwards? Uh, I want to uh, take make a make a, a bit of a jump over here, but I think it's I think it's it, it's a good uh, connection over here. Me of Vienna, who will bring him? Well, we just saw me. Who who's who? And the last verse also started off with the word me. Who right? Me Odea. Who knows? In other words, everyone knows. Uh, but if you think, meaning in other words, the me in this case is somebody who thinks about their lot in this in this world. That's the person who says, you know what, humans are different than man than than animal than animals because humans are striving for something better. That person, that who, that me, that person will bring them and see what's coming afterwards. Uh, in other words, if a if you are living a purely selfish lifestyle and you can't look beyond yourself and you can't go and you can't benefit others with, your, with what you have, with all your material gifts in this world, then you cannot have any fruits from your labors either. Right? A person would just be totally selfish with everything that they have. That person is not going to leave behind anything at all. And so there's no one to go and show them what's going what's to remain after them. There is no legacy. Uh, no one can bring me, me of Vienna again. The going with it is just a simple understanding is who would be able to bring you? Who's who is capable of bringing that person to see what they left over afterwards? No one, there's no one who's going to be able to, to show them that because there's nothing to show, right? Somebody who lives with a pure, uh, this, this tyrannical uh, mindset, they're never going to have anyone, no one's going to be able to show them what they left over in this world because they're not going to have anything to show. All right, and you look at 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 our, our, our tyrants throughout history, uh, and yes, they made tremendous waves on world history. There's no doubt about that. Each one of them in their own special way, but there's no legacy. <laughs> there's no one. I mean, unfortunately, there always are people who glorify the uh, the the evil people in history, but in reality, for the for the, for most of the world, no one's there to uh, to sing their praises after they're gone, uh, because it's just. That's not how it is. The world doesn't respect such a thing. So if a person lives this life vainly trying to chase happiness out of nothing, out of a, in a situation where happiness cannot be found, trying to lord over others and, and, and control others with their material possessions, and only living with this Kiwichelko, it's my, it's mine, 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 with that mindset, that person is not going to leave over anything for the for the world to see after them. Uh, and again, kind of this other understanding would be that this person mentioned in, in verse 21, the person who recognizes the difference between humankind and the, and the animal kingdom, that person will be able to see. That person will can show a person what legacy really looks like, right? If you recognize that we're more than just a, a, a lump of cells, that we're more than just animals, we live a different existence entirely, if you are that person, you have that recognition, that person can start to live and live, see beyond their own small area of this world. They can start to look into legacy and, and figure out, see ways to live, to, to continue living beyond life. And again, that was one of the things that the wise person at the end of chapter two had a hard time, hard time with, with that King Solomon himself was, was struggling with. How do I ensure that uh, I, I'm meaningful after I'm gone, 
Well, you want to know how to do that? This is kind of number two over here is, is living for other people also. Now, that doesn't mean only living for other people. There is something to say about a person not being only not only living for other people. A person also has to live for themselves, right? We're gonna we're gonna see more about that in the in the coming chapter. But the a person does have to learn how to include other people, how to benefit others with their uh, with their material in order so in order if that even if that is for a selfish purpose, they will gain something from that. Meaning if that's for the purpose of finding happiness, it'll be it'll work. And the person will find that legacy that the wise person was lack was was trying to find at the end of chapter two, uh, because you're right, wisdom and wealth can't do that alone, but being there for others can. That is something that a person can do to do that, uh, to to ensure a legacy beyond this world. Uh, one kind of last thing that I wanted to say on these couple of verses over here is we mentioned before that. In actually, it was verse number thirteen. We saw this before, and King Solomon kind of pointed over to out to us that we have this: uh, if a per, if a person's being honest with himself, and they say, "Okay, listen, I know that I deserve good things, right? Because I'm a human being. I'm a, I've worked hard for what I right. I whatever argument a person has for why they deserve good things, the same argument must apply to another person, to other people." just by logic. If it applies to me, it applies to other people, right? If I say that I deserve goodness, I deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, basically for the simple idea that I'm a human being, right? If you believe in what a lot of like founding fathers believed in, of uh, the natural laws that apply, to, natural rights that apply to humans, because hey, you're human, by the fact that you're human, then you deserve natural rights. Well, that applies then not just to the to me that applies to the person next to me that applies to the other person down the street that applies to every person i interact with we all uh, uh deserve by the just the fact that we're here and living and breathing and surviving and we all deserve certain good things so in that sense uh that you could almost look at the same argument you could flip that argument of the uh of the tyrant the the conglomeration of cells arguing back on on that person and say you deserve this because you are just who you are you deserve to rule over over, over other people you have that same thing should apply if it applies to you it should apply to everybody else too right and it's kind of this uh, idea of I'm, I'm afraid to use the word equality because it's just it's such a you know a, 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 a heavy word in in today's uh um uh, rhetoric nowadays, but it, it is kind of the word I'm looking for, right? There is a sense of each person has a equal rights to certain things. Okay, <laughs> let's just put it that way. It's kind of kind of hard to hard, hard to say, say it without getting, you know, the, going political. But there is there's a fact of the matter is that people have. If I deserve goodness, other people should deserve goodness too, and that's just the way things are. Okay, and so that's kind of we're hearkening back to that let message from chap from uh, verse number 13 or bring it back over here and saying that's got to be part of our part of your searching for happiness this has got to be part of it you got to include other people in that i, I am going to start the next chapter uh, in the last couple minutes that we have it's a long verse but he is gonna i, I will probably do it again next week i'm gonna be honest we'll probably do it again next week but i just want to start it this week um and he's now going to realign us now he's not gonna he's veering off of happiness just for a second and he instead he wants to really get into this idea of the tyrant of what tyranny looks like and what that looks like for the for the ones who are oppressed uh and that and he, he's going to discuss that here at least at the beginning of chapter four i believe this is in a, a with a target to figure out where's the goodness in this because as we mentioned, there's got to be goodness in here somewhere. He called it Havel. That means that there's some drop of, of, of right here. It mixed into a lot of wrong. So what, what is that? I think we're going to start seeing that in this, in this chapter over here. Uh, but we're just going to read this verse, and then we'll probably stop there. Uh, Vishav Tiani. Now, I am literally means I'm sitting, but it could also potentially mean I'm returning. So he's saying, we talked about this. But now we're going to get into it a little deeper. So Vishav Tiani, I'm returning to this. 
and I will see, literally, or I have seen, potentially that Vav, the letter Vav can switch a tense on the word. Uh, so I am seeing, or I have seen, et kol ha'ashukim, all of the oppressed, asher na'asim tachat ha'shamesh, which have been created or made under the sun, again, under the sun meaning in pursuit of material, of the material. Vihine, and behold, dimat ha'ashukim, there are tears of the oppressed. Ve'en lahem menachem, and they have no uh, consolation. They have no uh, um, c- no way to be consoled. Umiyad oshekehem koach, and from the hands of their oppressors is power. And again, ve'en lahem menachem, there is no there is no uh, respite. There is no consolation for this person. Okay. So interesting idea. He's he's flipping into back into his flowery kind of poetic way of speaking uh, by repeating a term twice. So let me read that one more time. Vishavtiani, I'm returning to this point because we mentioned it, again, we mentioned it, and now we're going to spend a little more time on it. And I have seen all of the oppressed, Asher Nasim Tachatashemesh, which have been done or created or made in the pursuit of the material under the sun. There is the tear of the oppressed, like tears and crying. They have no comfort. And f- literally from the hands of their oppressors is power. Uh, I looked at multiple translations and everyone seems to translate it as in the hands of their oppressors is power. It, it literally it means from the hands of their oppressors is power. I don't know what to do with that, but uh, we'll get into it more next week, hopefully. Uh, but in the hands of their oppressors is power. And again, they have no comfort. I, I'm curious already, just reading the verse, is are, are, is the no comfort to the oppressed in both cases? Is that referring to the oppressed? Or is perhaps the second one referring to the oppressors, that even the oppressors cannot find comfort? That's something we have to perhaps uh, look into next week. Uh, but this is where we're going to actually stop for right now. Don't want to get too deep into this because... We'll start over from again from here at this verse number one next week. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to end the share now. Okay. And uh, that's all we have for this week. So again, thank you.